So welcome everyone to the July Repronym webinar. We are super excited to be joined this week by Mike O'Shea from uh, the University of North Carolina, uh, the uh, leader of the extremely low gestational age newborn, the Elgin project. Uh, and again, as we're in our new themes of trying to talk about some biology and some technology, uh, I've invited Mike to tell us about this you know, lovely long-term 15 year, 20 year follow-up of some a cohort of extremely uh, premature children. Uh, and he'll tell us about that cohort and some of the you know, clinical and behavioral and early imaging findings. And then I'll use that as a jumping off place to look at some of the reproducibility topics uh, behind you know, a specific bit of the neuroimaging that is in this you know, new phase of this, uh, the diffusion imaging. Uh, so I think without any further ado, I will turn it over to you, Mike. Great, thank you, David, so much. And can everyone hear me okay, nod your head. Okay, yep. great. So I wanted to thank David for giving me the opportunity to talk with you and I'll spend about 20 minutes talking about this collaboration between the extremely low gestational age newborn cohort. And as David said, it started about 20 years ago. And, um, and the other half of the collaboration is called Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes, which is a new partner. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. David play, plays a important part in that combined project. So um, I have no, figure out how to advance the slides. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And I'm gonna begin by talking about the study purpose, why it was designed, what it was, um, what the objective was to answer. Uh, and then just describe the study itself. As David mentioned, we're now in the 19th year of follow-up. And then, um, talk a little bit about the current interest in cognitive and psychiatric consequences of preterm babies, a uh, little bit about types and frequencies of newborn brain injury. I'll speak primarily about ultrasound. I'm not an expert in MRI as David is, so he will probably fill in the gaps in that realm. Uh, as you may be aware, extremely preterm births are uncommon accounting for less than 1% of US births, about 28,000 each year. This is a baby born at 22 weeks, which is about as early as babies can be uh, born in this uh, day and age. And this um, little one that you see on the left uh, grew up to become the little girl that you see in the lower right corner of the Elgan book. She's now around four or five, is given permission to use her photograph and lectures and also on the cover of this book about the LDN study. Some historical perspective in 1960, a one kilogram baby uh, was, uh, had a mortality risk of 95%, a survival probability of 5%. And 40 years later, that was completely flipped so that these babies now have a risk of surviving of 95% and a mortality risk of 5%. <clears throat> so in the year, um, or in the years since 2000, uh, babies born at 22 weeks survive about 29% of the time in high income countries, and that's been increasing rather steadily. So as survival increases, there is greater and greater interest about the neurodevelopmental outcomes, which impact the ability to live independently and societal cost. So I wanna give a acknowledgement to Alvin Leventon, who designed and really gave birth to the Elgan study. He began designing it in the mid nineties. He was an adult neurologist, but became interested in preterm brain injury uh, through some of the postdoctoral work that he did. And he was aware that there were a number of epidemiologic studies showing a connection between perinatal infection and brain disorder in the offspring. And he hypothesized <coughs> based on preclinical animal models, uh, based on some work being done in 
neural malaria, and also some of the emerging literature about multiple sclerosis. He postulated that systemic inflammation might be the link between perinatal infection in the mother and brain disorder in the offspring, and that there might be an intermediate, that is white matter damage, that could be seen on ultrasound. He also postulated the existence of non-infectious initiators of inflammation and the existence of endogenous protective molecules like neurotrophins, growth factors, and angiogenic factors. So this was his conceptual model, again, informed by preclinical work, as well as some analogous conditions in, in adults. <coughs> And he organized this study at 14 U.S. hospitals shown in the red dots. Babies were enrolled if they were born before 28 weeks, enrolled 2002 to 2004. So they're now range in age between um, what 19 and 17. And he arranged for the measurement of inflammation biomarkers and neurotrophic biomarkers. This is a partial list. Some of these are familiar to you, like CRP. And these were measured in small quantities of blood, drops of blood obtained from the babies when they were having laboratory testing, placed onto filter paper, dried, and then stored. And these spots can be stored at least for 20 years without any degradation of DNA or RNA or protein. So we've used these blood spots for numerous things, but particularly for proteomics of these protein biomarkers of inflammation. And the longitudinal <coughs> aspect of the study is shown here, where around the time of birth, brain ultrasounds <coughs> were collected. Ventricular enlargement and echolucency are markers of white matter injury. Two-year neurologic outcomes were assessed. The Bailey scales is a measure of early cognitive impairment. CBCL is a measure of child behavior. The MCHAT is an autism screen. With additional funding, the children were seen at 10 years for IQ testing, assessment of executive function, academic achievement, uh, epilepsy evaluation. The CSI is a behavioral inventory. And then brain MRI on the subset. And then with the current funding from the Elgan ECHO collaboration, 15-year outcomes were assessed, and currently 18-year outcomes are being assessed. And these adolescent outcomes include IQ testing, executive function, academic achievement, epilepsy. The mini kid is a structured psychiatric evaluation, and brain MRI on 450 of the adolescents. And David, I believe, will speak more on that in a moment. We're also assessing for physical activity, risky behaviors, substance abuse, nutrition, and COVID-related questions. There has been sample attrition of about two to three per year, so we're down to about 700. And as you might anticipate, the uh, members of the cohort that have been lost to follow up tend to be overrepresented among offspring of mothers with um, no, no more than high school education, uh, mothers that were not married, and mothers eligible for Medicaid. So a very broad stroke um, summary of what we found in terms of outcomes at 10 years is shown here, where IQ the proportion in the Elgan cohort is shown in blue. The general population statistics in the red, and you see a much higher risk of IQ under 70, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD about twice as common, and anxiety about three times as common. For internalizing disorders, general anxiety more common, dysthymic disorders, and social phobias, the stars indicate statistically significant results, and externalizing disorders, ADHD, the inattentive form, the hyperactive form actually is no more common in the preterm cohorts, and the combined form is more common. So as I believe many of you are aware, ultrasound is used to screen babies 
that are born before 30 weeks gestation as a routine clinical test, first between seven and 14 days, and then between 36 and 40 weeks post-menstrual age to detect intraventricular hemorrhage and white matter injury like PBL and ventricular enlargement. Uh, the abnormalities that are seen can be classified as either hypo, hy, hyperechoic, also called echo-dense, or hypoechoic, also called echo-lucent. The, hypo, the echo-dense lesions are usually near the endocardial nucleus, where they are assumed to represent germinal matrix hemorrhage, um, or if they're in the ventricles, intraventricular hemorrhage. This is an example here on a coronal view the uh, echo-dense intraventricular blood. There's also some echo-density in the brain parenchyma. Another example in the brain parenchyma. Echo-lucent abnormalities can be seen in the cerebrum or in the cerebellum. Um, often, there will be an echo-density on the early scan followed by an echo-lucency in the late scan in the same region. This is extensive echo-lucency thought to represent white matter injury, and this, these are just enlarged ventricles indicated with a V. <coughs> Sometimes the uh, echolucency is adjacent to the ventricle and gives rise to this very irregularly shaped ventricle. And then the frequency in our cohort, about a quarter had the intraventricular hemorrhage, 12% ventricular enlargement, 16% an echo dense lesion in the parenchyma, 8% an echolucent lesion in the brain parenchyma. And the significance of these is shown here. So with autism spectrum disorder, we did not see much association between these neonatal ultrasound lesions, IVH, white matter injury, IVH plus white matter injury, and autism. But with cerebral palsy, particularly with white matter injury, uh, very large odds ratios, 16 to or so um, for cerebral palsy and odds ratios around three to five for cognitive impairment, showing that these white matter injury indicators on ultrasound are predictive of a cerebral palsy and cognitive impairment later on. There are limitations of ultrasound and hence the need for MRI. There's low inter-reader agreement particularly about wrinkle echo density. There's low sensitivity for the detection of non-cystic white matter injury. The peripheral cortex, cerebellum, nasal ganglion, brainstem are not well visualized with the routine scanning approaches. And there's no consensus approach to quantifying the severity of injury. And all of you as MRI experts know that each of these can be readily addressed with MRI and hence the importance um, of the MRIs that we now have. A little bit about the, uh, going back to the key uh, objective of the study to see whether inflammatory and anti-inflammatory protein biomarkers are associated with, um, uh, with um, uh, adverse outcomes. This was a study where we related these protein biomarkers to uh, MRI volumes at 10 years and cognitive function at 10 years. And as you can see in the summary in a multivariate model predicting IQ from the cerebellum, brainstem, white matter, and gray matter volumes, the cerebellar and brainstem was significantly associated with IQ, the white matter volume, borderline significance, and the gray matter volume not significantly related to IQ. So this is really what we have so far, but David is helping us make sense of the 15 year data and we anticipate having results from that in the coming year. So a brief summary then of the Elgin study thus far, early life inflammation uh, antecedent, uh, or it is an antecedent to later brain disorders, multiple hits of inflammation, so worse than a single hit. Inflammation is associated with multiple brain disorders. <clears throat> and then we have found some environmental influences on inflammation, such as prenatal factors, 
and placental epigenetics. Uh, neonatal systemic inflammation has been related to white matter injury, to MRI brain volumes, neuro-ophthalmologic abnormalities, ADHD, learning difficulties, intellectual deficit, executive function dysfunctions, and social responsiveness deficits. And as I mentioned, multiple hits seem worse at a single day protein elevation. Um, so I'm gonna turn now in the last five minutes of my comments, just to what we are doing now in this combined LGAN ECHO study. I mentioned earlier, ECHO stands for Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. This is a consortium of existing cohorts like the LGAN study. We are charged with studying early life environmental exposures, high impact pediatric conditions like neurodevelopmental conditions, and asking solution oriented questions. Um, within the, uh, the ECHO consortium, we already have a lot of data on neurodevelopmental disorders and, and mental health disorders, where we are collecting data on obesity, asthma, global health, that is well, a sense of well-being, life satisfaction, quality of life, uh, blood pressure, and renal function. And as many of you know, all of these factors either relate to brain uh, um, structure as outcomes or relate to brain structure as antecedents. So obesity, for example, um, uh, is a strong pro-inflammatory stimulus, which could have adverse effects on the brain. Likewise, renal function, if impaired, can have adverse effects on the brain. So it's very important that we're now collecting uh, data on these within the LGAN cohort. We're also looking outside of the four walls of the neonatal intensive care and family factors, community factors, residential factors. And we're looking at links between the early life environment, placental epigenetic variation, and later child outcomes. The prenatal factors that we've already identified as being associated with neonatal inflammation and neurodevelopmental impairment are listed here. Socioeconomic disadvantage, pre-pregnancy obesity, perhaps because of pro-inflammatory signals from the obese mother, intrauterine growth restriction, and then certain bacteria residing in the placenta. We're going further within the LCAN ECHO consortium to look at smoking during pregnancy, maternal pre-pregnancy diabetes, pre-pregnancy asthma, environmental pollution, air pollution. We're looking at metal contaminants within the umbilical cord, and we're looking at organic pollutants using dried blood spots from mother's blood that was collected around the time of delivery. The kinds of questions we're asking are these, to what extent do prenatal factors program for neuroinflammation and or dismaturation of the brain. And I think many of you are familiar with this marker hypothesis, the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis, which posits that maternal conditions during pregnancy can imprint on the fetus and alter the, um, the programming for later life disease. And one of the mechanisms that has been hypothesized to account for this programming is in fact epigenetic control of gene expression. We're looking now at DNA methylation and we have, and DNA methylation as you may be aware is like a switch for gene expression with heavily methylated genes being turned off, demethyl or unmethylated genes being more turned on and expressed. So we have um, a supplement through the uh, NIH diversity supplement where we are looking at the relationships between the placenta brain axis. And within this, one of our aims relates in fact to brain volume alterations that will be assessed with the MRI. So I'm gonna stop here and leave a few times for questions. Um, and I wanted to make a few comments about data sharing, but I did want to um, 
really give a shout out to the success this project has had because of people like David and other senior mentors. We have four undergraduate student trainees working with the project, three postdoctoral trainees, um, junior faculty, and graduate and medical student trainees, uh, 12 of these. I want to thank the study coordinators without whom the project would not be possible for doing the enrolling and retaining this cohort over almost 20 years. Uh, the Elgan Echo investigators, among these, we have experts in MRI, uh, Ryan McNaughton, a um, PhD student at Boston University, working with David and with Hernan uh, Jara. Um, and then um, I thank, I thank, of course, our funding from the NIH. So let me unshare, and, and I did want to mention before um, we open it up for questions. David had asked me to talk a bit about data sharing and how these data can be made available. So really on two uh, levels, all of the Elgan data that I mentioned from the first two phases of the study, that is through age 10 years. So all of the um, prenatal biomarkers, uh, like uh, uh, placental biomarkers, placental bacteriology, all of the um, uh, uh, placental, bio, uh, sorry, neonatal blood biomarker data, all of the neurological outcomes, cognitive outcomes, executive function measures at 10 years, all of that is available through NINDS. And I will send to David uh, a slide set that contains the information about how to access that. So that's publicly available now. The data that's being collected in Elgan Echo, which would be the 15-year data uh, and the brain MRI data, uh, is being I guess you would you might say embargoed for one year so that the ECHO investigators can work on it. And then it will be again publicly available. And that will be in July of 2023. The extant uh, data, which really would be pretty much what I just mentioned, is also available through the ECHO program. Uh, as of July of this year, but the 15-year data would be available in July of 2023, and I can provide information about how to access that. Um, so let me stop there and see if there are any questions uh, for me, and then I think David uh, will take over. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was a great overview of the program. Uh, and again, before I get into some technical weeds, I wanted to see if anyone had any questions or or uh, comments at that sort of uh, high level, uh, the sort of biology level. Can you say anything why the cerebral palsy is such a, um, so, pronou so pronounced, you know, why, and, or again, so that struck me just sort of a naive, you know, person that that was one of the biggest, you know, sort of amplified factors, you know, from prematurity. Yeah. So as you said, David, if you, if you look at, if you ask the question, what is the most common neurodevelopmental impairment in this cohort of LGANs, it's not cerebral palsy, it would be cognitive impairment. But as you said, if you look at what impairment is most strongly associated with extreme prematurity, by far it's cerebral palsy with an odds ratio of about 100. It's about 100 times more common than in the general a population of births. And the, um, the hypothesis of that is that it's all about the timing of the insult because the, um, the events leading to extreme prematurity uh, presumably are operating uh, in the late second trimester. And then the baby is born and spends the third trimester in the neonatal intensive care unit with infections and so forth, bad insults. And by the time they go home, the most of the acute type of neurologic injury has presumably occurred. And then everything downstream from that is sort of, if you've, if you've knocked off progenitor cells, for example, or if you've had epigenetic programming that's gonna alter migration 
of, uh, and, and further myelination, but the big acute hits are thought to occur in late second trimester and third trimester when the corticospinal tracts are evolving. And, you know, I don't, I'm not a neuroscientist the way some people on the call may be, but my understanding is that a lot of that wiring is laid down by, you know, about 12 months of life and is thereby complete. And so it's the most vulnerable within that window of insults. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. And uh, we will be, uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, uh, the Elgin Echo Project is one of our newly proposed uh, service projects as part of the phase two of Reprenim. So there'll be lots of stuff to continue to work on you know, together along the vein of what I'm going to start a discussion of yeah, now. Jumping off from you know, the introduction that Mike you know, gave about Elgin in general, I'm going to dig into some of the weeds around some of the analysis within the 15-year imaging protocol. We'll talk a little bit about what that protocol is, uh, a reminder of you know, the high-level hypothesis that we're, we're going after, and really trying to do this uh, consideration of the diffusion analysis that I'm responsible for and the reprenim way of, of trying to do something. Uh, and to some extent, I'm a good example of a bad example, someone who's old, someone who doesn't really know an awful lot about current you know, programming techniques, someone who's very set in the old ways of doing analyses, which is you know, fairly antithetical to uh, many of the missions you know, that reprenim is trying and a sort of an example of the types of things that you know Reprenim is trying to change, you know, in the way you know much analysis goes on going forward. Uh, so with that in mind, we'll see how an old dog, you know, like me, did with you know trying to do the new you know, sort of Reprenimish tricks. So at age 15, uh, Mike mentioned there's a imaging protocol uh, that has a couple of different phases to it. Uh, the core imaging protocol is about a 25-minute protocol, which you know is really keyed on a tri-TSE, a three turbo spin echo sequence uh, by getting you know, T1 weighted, T2 weighted, and proton density weighting. Uh, that really provides the basis to do uh, sort of quantitative T1, T2 proton density mapping. So this kind of quantitative analysis protocol. So that's really this key. It's spin echo. It's you know, moderately high resolution. So it's you know, fairly insensitive to, um, to uh, Artifacts, you know, such as as you know, braces and things like that, that are fairly common in the 15-year-old population. Also, with that is a 16-shot, sort of a mildly, you know, uh, modern, you know, diffusion uh, uh, acquisition. Uh, so, 16 directions, fairly quick, uh, fairly easily done by the many different sites, uh, and then a five gradient echo, multi-echo gradient echo. Uh, you know, uh, assessment of uh, uh, susceptibility. The sites that can do it and the sites that have the time in their protocol to do it, add a second set of, uh, you know, diffusion uh, directions so that, you know, if you get both of these, we have a 32 direction, much better, you know, sort of uh, diffusion coverage, uh, get the opportunity to do a high resolution structural scan and rage uh, and, you know, do five minutes of a uh, resting state uh, uh, eyes open, you know, acquisition. Uh, so that you know, sort of adds on some sort of modern, you know, expected types of things of, of neuroimaging studies, uh, and then a couple sites, uh, you know, who have access to you know the right equipment, you know, to do this, you know, quick, quickly, you know, also add on an HCP ABCD like diffusion acquisition, so much much you know more modern, you know, state of the art acquisition in terms of diffusion. There's only a couple sites, you know, that were able to do this, so that's you know sort of builds up. So ultimately, we have sort of three different diffusion you know, acquisitions. Some sites just do 16, some sites will do 32, and others will do the 32 plus, you know, the um, 102 direction, you know, ABCD, HCP protocol. The high level aim of this project is to determine whether these early life inflammation markers that uh, Mike was talking about are associated with, you know, different, you know, effects in the brain volumetry and microstructural findings of gray and white matter at age 15. Uh, and to establish the, the relationships between all of these, you know, myriad facets of, you know, birth and behavior and clinical and cognitive outcomes uh, and relate those to the brain uh, biological, you know, basis using these quantitative MRI metrics, using diffusion MRI, using volumetry and anatomy types of, of analysis techniques. As I mentioned, you know, there's a large number of sites. This covers both uh, one and a half and three Tesla 
you know, some older clinical sites and more you know, modern you know, 3T sites and all three different manufacturers. And again, about originally sort of uh, 482 cases, not all of which you know, passed the QC. Uh, so there's probably 400, a little over 400 that are you know, sort of high quality data sets. Just a quick you know, snapshot, this TriTSE, again, is the core you know, acquisition that permits uh, the quantitative uh, analysis, the quantitative, you know, the QMRI, the quantitative assessments of T1, T2 uh, proton density. Uh, this is the five you know, echo, uh, multi-echo susceptibility you know, mapping uh, acquisition. Uh, the 16 shots of you know, one of the vectors of the, you know, the diffusion across the top here. MP rage uh, and resting state, you know, are in some, you know, the sites. Uh, and then if you're lucky enough, uh, the, you know, multi-shelled, uh, multi-directional uh, ABCD, you know, diffusion protocols are, are also run. So this complete data set, you know, gives us, yes, this sort of quantitative MRI, you know, uh, assessments that we talked about. The MP rages gives us, you know, access into brain structure, brain surface types of things. The resting state gives us, you know, types of connectivity information. And again, the piece I'm responsible for is trying to see what information we can get out of the regional diffusion, you know, measurements. Now, again, it's, uh, this is a big, you know, consortium. Uh, and again, the goal of, you know, my particular, you know, data analysis efforts and you know, all the data analysis efforts now really are to generate these sort of raw, vectors of information about each subject to contribute back to the to the collective you know of this of the elgin center in order to then do you know planned uh, assessments you know between these measures and the various you know behavioral uh, cognitive you know birth etc things so to some extent this is feeding raw data back into higher order statistics and hypotheses you know that uh, get carried out uh, Mike alluded to Ryan and Hernan at uh, Boston University, who really do the lion's share of data coordination. Uh, they do the aggregation across the anonymization, and they run the entire quantitative MRI analysis protocols, uh, which generate you know a huge you know set of the of the data, and they've already sort of completed that you know on the entire cohort, uh, and so that you know and then the, that then becomes the data that you know the rest of us get to use for these other other types of areas. So uh, I sort of use this opportunity to actually try to remind myself what the Repronym way is. I'm not quite sure we've ever presented it that way. So uh, I enjoyed you know, thinking about that for a little bit. So there's sort of two axes, you know, I think that's sort of emerging as the Repronym way. You know, the first of which is, you know, these things we really, these types of things we want everyone to do. We want everyone to plan everything ahead of time. Don't plan and change, you know, later. We want people to version control everything. We want people to use standards you know, for everything. We want people to test everything to make sure it's always working. And we want people to publish you know, everything. So again, there's some caveats you know, to this you know, sort of you know, high level mantra. You know, not everything is you know, appropriate for version control or everything is appropriate for you know, uh, standardization, but anything that is appropriate you know, sort of falls into this you know, everything you know, concept. Also this concept of publish everything. Uh, I think we need to keep remembering that publish is a very broad you know, type of concept. Publish you know, can be personal you know, publishing so that the future you, you know, knows where that document is, you know, that tells you, you know, how, to, how this analysis was done. Uh, publication can be an internal document for you know, the future person doing your job in your lab to, in order to understand, to, to know that there is a documentation of, of that procedure. And then that could be sort of the external types of publications, you know, from preprints, which are not peer reviewed, to sort of postprints or peer reviewed types of things. So all this is a spectrum you know, of publication that, again, we want to be able to share, but we don't want to. Um, um, but you know, there's different degrees. You know, that one. Not everything has to be a peer reviewed, you know, uh, journal of neuroscience publication. But we publish these things so that you know the other relevant folks you know, can understand exactly what we've done and not lose you know that you know, collective knowledge. So the reprinim way is also often talked about in terms of the you know, sort of stages of, of you know, neuroimaging research, you know, from study design through data collection, through data processing, through statistical analysis, through you know, the publication of those results, the making of a claim and, and supporting of that. Uh, so ultimately, I'm thinking of the reprinim way really as a combination of those two you know, factors. And for each of the five you know, major areas, study design, data collection, uh, statistical analysis, uh, publishing, and data processing, you know, we need to take sure, uh, take account of the planning, of the version controlling, of the standards, of the, uh, you know, uh, version control, of, you know, the 
sharing you know, of, of each of these, of these elements. So ultimately, you know, that two by two you know, set of matrices you know, give lots of different features that we want to keep in mind. I'm not gonna read these you know, all here, but there's you know, these issues that sort of make up you know, sort of the complete you know, sort of repronym way. So uh, taking uh, you know, what I've been doing you know, in the analysis side of the you know, Elgin uh, work, let's see to what extent you know, I've you know, accomplished you know, some you know, of the repronym way. And again, always remember that the repronym way is a guideline uh, and that you know, we aspire to do a little bit better you know, each time we set up and do you know, a new analysis. Uh, so clearly I'm not going to accomplish all these things, uh, but we're gonna see what I can do and what I can't do and you know, try to work you know, from there. So to some extent, the planning you know, of this analysis is you know, fairly you know, well you know, planned in the sense that we received ICOM data from a bunch of different sites. Uh, these are converted you know, into you know, standard representations using Hudicom from Repro N, uh, and we do quality control you know, currently with MRIQC and DTI prep specifically for the diffusion data. Ultimately, we generate the diffusion scalar metrics you know, using a uh, set of FSL you know, based procedures for eddy current correction, brain extraction, and tensor calculation. Uh, we do registration of this into a standard space uh, using the FSL, FLIRT, and FINERT uh, functionalities, uh, and we, you know, process that we you know, apply, we generate, you know, some uh, regions that we know of in the uh, uh, MNI 152 space uh, that has the regions of interest that we care about. So we use FSL processing to, you know, apply, you know, the warpings, you know, back and forth, you know, of the atlases we need back into subject space. Uh, and then we extract, you know, the regional metrics, you know, from the regions of, you know, Harvard Oxford Anatomy and JHU uh, tractography, you know, types of things using tools within the FSL stats, uh, FSL tools, such as FSL stats. So that's the plan. So again, I don't wanna to dwell too long on all this. We can look at it in later. This is the raw data you know, off of you know, two of the different sites, uh, extracting the series IDs using Reaper in you know, methodology lets us you know, map these various uh, uh, direct, uh, series IDs and series descriptions you know, into their appropriate uh, bids, you know, localization. So it ends up in your bids, you know, structure, you know, properly. MRIQC, I will be, you know, relevant for the, you know, structural uh, analysis. It's not so much my domain at the moment. We'll hear about that from other folks, you know, on some other occasion. Uh, but uh, that lets you look at the, you know, structural uh, assessment of, you know, contrast to noise, signal to noise, uh, lots of metrics across your different uh, populations and sort of understand outliers and understand data quality. Uh, so that factors into either covariates or, you know, inclusion, exclusion types of criteria. Uh, we all may already, you know, remember that, you know, these, uh, Diffusion imaging protocols, you know, take multiple, you know, directions as part of that, and sort of the basic 16 direction is, you know, playing through here. Uh, there's a base image, and then 16 different directional encodings. Uh, the signal decreases in each of the you know, specific directions uh, as a function of you know how much diffusion is happening in that direction. So those images get uh, put together to create uh, the diffusion tensor representation. Uh, shown here, uh, just a blow up of you know, one little region of the brain. So they, these you know, 16 directions solve for the local tensor. Tensors can be symmetric in you know, sort of isotropic you know, locations, or they can be pointed uh, and anisotropic in the regions of, of different you know, highly oriented uh, fiber systems. So this is looking at the degree of anisotropy. Bright things here are, you know, have a particular direction. Uh, in this image, we don't know which direction, but things that are bright tend to be the white matter pathways. Uh, and you know, show up here, and then we can lay on you know the directional information with this color coding. So things that are left and right going, you know, tend to be in red. Things that are you know uh, front to back going tend to be in green, and things that are up and down going tend to be in blue. So that you know gives us both the magnitude of the color based on the degree of you know anisotropy and the color you know telling us direction. So you things like, see things like corpus callosums and internal capsules and you know, other. You know, features, a uh, single bundle extensions you know, through here. So these are really the core things that we're deriving, you know, the mean diffusivity, the fractional isotropy, the orientation maps you know, for each of the subjects. Uh, and we then apply you know, the atlases for structure. So we get regional uh, you know, caudate, putamen, subcortical, cortical, white matter, you know, broad definitions from the Harvard-Oxford you know, uh, atlas. Uh, and we use the Johns Hopkins University tracked you know, atlas to give us all sorts of nice uh, 
white matter anatomic regions. So for each of these regions, we can then generate what's the average of our fractional anisotropy, what's the average for our mean diffusivity, what's the standard deviation of our you know, FA and MD you know, across these regions. Uh, so those become sort of our core you know, basic metrics that we're generating. Lots of regions, you know, lots of you know, means and standard deviations and features like that across you know, the lots of subjects. So what this ends up in is a very you know, extensive you know, data table uh, that you know, per subject, we have you know, lots of measurements of you know, fraction of such mean diffusivity across you know, lots of you know, different regions. Uh, there, so these are you know, many of the different subjects coming from many of the different sites. Uh, so, and then looking at sort of internal to the diffusion data, some of the parameters, the degree to which you know, mean diffusivity and you know, FA you know, correlate with each other can be you know, examined. Uh, and you know, different regions you know, sort of show different relationships of that. Uh, and again, ultimately, this then becomes the pile of raw data that you know, we use to look between the different measures within MRI, look between the different, and look at these you know, measures uh, with, as a function of clinical behavioral birth details uh, and relative to uh, term measures about the gestational you know, age, you know, the different you know, uh, subjects and, and things of that sort. So that's the raw data. And technically, I'm not really supposed to go beyond that into the interpretation you know, of any of these or the you know, biology of it, because that you know, really needs you know, planned hypotheses. But I couldn't help myself. I did a quick you know, scan you know, uh, uh, examination of you know, just raw correlations you know, between our different you know, measures, you know, diffusion measures, and different features such as you know, birth weight or gestational age and you know, body mass index and head circumferences, things like that, just to get some distributions of you know, Sort of what kind of correlations we're seeing you know, in you know this population? Uh, so there is you know some evidence that we have you know a handful of you know things that are going on and ignore the <laughs> pretend you didn't see you know the bottom ones where I just kind of uh, uh, cherry pick you know a couple of these you know sort of high correlation regions just to kind of get a sense of of what's going on in the data. But again, the actual proper statistical analyses will take planned comparisons you know with our uh, biological team and our statistical analysis team within the Elgin protocol. So in the reprinted way, uh, I finally successfully did, you know, sort of publish and version control, you know, a lot of the workflows uh, that went into the system. I actually uh, have a GitHub account. I actually created, you know, this as a GitHub project. Uh, and so all of the workflow development, you know, has happened under that sort of version control mechanisms. Uh, the, the analysis is done under a FSL based, you know, container. Uh, so, uh, that was created and that is you know accessible through the GitHub uh, you know uh, distribution you know you know there. So the question is you know of the various you know things and you know, did we plan? Well, sure, we had an analysis plan. Uh, did we use standards? Well, yeah, the data got you know converted you know pretty quickly into Nifty and and bids from its you know DICOM you know sources. Uh, did we you know containerize you know things? Yes. Uh, and again, we're not so much involved in the statistical plan yet. Uh, but can we publish you know, these? So yes, that container is available through the GitHub and that uh, workflow is you know, available through the GitHub. So ultimately, you know, there's you know, moderate success and moderate you know, failures you know, in this example. Uh, we've already mentioned you know, the standards bids, the processing containers using NeuroDocker, uh, using version control for the workflows and containers. A bunch of things I wasn't able to do, not because I can't do them, but just you know didn't you know, happen. Uh, we don't have the semantic you know markup you know on our bids you know, representations. Uh, I'm not using version control for the data. I, I'm not using data lad. Uh, we haven't pre-registered any of the analyses you know that we're we were planning. Uh, I used a specific um, uh, qual quality control script. Uh, there are other perhaps you know more modern quality control that I should be doing. Uh, and as we know, you know. Everything else we've looked at from structure, you know, and uh, functional MRI, you know, says that tools, you know, matter. Uh, so we really should be, uh, you know, not just resting on the FSL tool by itself, but also comparing and contrasting to other tools such as DIPI, DI prep, etc. Uh, and there's a lot of issues. There's multiple sites, multiple uh, uh, field strengths, and things like that. So we really need to make sure to get combat uh, some sort of site correction, you know, in there, such as combat. And uh, I'm not doing this under any unit testing yet which uh, certainly is emerging as an important feature. So I think that's 
where I will end with my successes and failures of attempting to use you know, both define you know, sort of more specifically what the reprinim way is in the context of a particular diffusion analysis. Uh, and I will stop my screen share here and see how we're doing for time. Excellent, a little bit of time. Uh, and I will see if there's comments or questions or, or things from the uh, audience to discuss about my attempt. Okay, PJ, how difficult was it to obtain ethical approval for the Elgin study? Yeah, it probably is uh, more of a Dr. O'Shea question. I'll certainly uh, uh, pose that to him. And to some extent, the you know, hardest part of that ethics, you know, presumably was from the birth you know, 15, 20 years ago at birth when uh, the subjects were you know, invited to, to participate you know, in this you know, study. Uh, and I do not know much of that, you know, ancient history. So that would be a good question for Dr. O'Shea. Uh, presumably now that the kids are, you know, 15, et cetera, you know, their assent, et cetera, and parental you know, consent is, you know, fairly normal for, for ongoing imaging studies. But I suspect you know, approaching a mother who just had, you know, a 22 week you know, infant, the ethics on you know, how to approach that you know, could be a little tricky. So is, is the first time point for the diffusion Im imaging, is that actually at age 10? Or is there earlier diffusion imaging data also? No, so imaging itself has only happened at 10 and 15. And for the most part, uh, the diffusion in the official protocol only started at age 15. So there will be the qMRI at 10 and 15, but not the diffusion or the resting state or the structural. That being said, certain sites, i.e. our site, you know, always did, you know, uh, and we, you know, we've been a site for both the 10 year old and 15 year old. So we've always done the diffusion and always done the resting state, you know, as part of the Elgin children that we've seen. So there may be some limited data that has both 10 year old and 15 year old uh, data, but that wasn't systematically done until age 15. And from, from Mike's presentation, I'm hugely fascinated by the prevalence of you know these ultrasound things early on and what echo of those abnormalities that we're seeing at you know seven weeks you know you know have any you know impact on what's you know principally you know normal normal looking you know MRI scans at 10 and 15. So uh, that yeah that's what I'm wondering in terms of the development of those connections whether well, I guess there'd be some dovetail that might show up in the resting state data where you can converge those imaging sets, but that's just a pretty interesting question in terms of what's happening with those fiber systems. So despite some of those horrible ultrasounds he's shown, you know, those brains later do not look you know, that bad. So, but clearly mm -hmm. something probably, you know, happened, especially again, because of the relationship of those and the cerebral palsy as well. So, mm -hmm. well, Hearing no questions, uh, I will remind our present people and listenership that um, there will be no August um, presentation, but we will resume in September. So stay tuned to your Twitter and uh, email and other information channels from us for that next September presentation. So with that, I'll thank everyone for attending. Uh, I'll thank Dr. O'Shea for, for joining us and uh, and thank you.